I visited this last week in Weatherford with my very, very dear friends, George and Debbie, uh, and he's facing literally life-threatening heart, open heart surgery. They shared with me that since the messages have been put on Facebook and YouTube, and I don't know which way they do it, and I don't know how they do it. You know me, I'm not a technical person. But they have some kind of an app that they can download it to their smart TV, and they actually watch this on their big screen TV there in their den. And this message today is for the honor and glory of Christ and nothing and no one else, but I'm thinking of George and Debbie as we look at this message. Daniel chapter 3. I like this passage of Scripture just because I like saying Nebuchadnezzar and that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego <laughs> for me to be able to say those four names kind of fast and get through them for those slow talking more from Texas is something. But uh, we see in this passage of Scripture something about conviction, courage, and commitment. And we're going to talk about dealing with life's dilemmas. Anybody in here ever felt have, have to deal with a dilemma in life? Anybody may be dealing with a dilemma in life right now? Well, if not, it's kind of like Texas weather. Just wait a minute. You know, something will change. But the glory and the beauty of being a born-again child of God is it makes no difference what form or shape the dilemma comes. We know who's in control. Amen? And if we have the conviction of a faith in Jesus Christ and the courage of the Holy Spirit and the commitment that we will be true to God and to God's Word and to His Son Jesus who has saved us, then we can have the same kind of experience that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. I want to give you just a little bit of background before we read our Scripture text. and You, you probably know most of the story, but it would do well for us to, to remind ourselves because it shows us how fickle life can be. And how fickle, that is, quick-changing people can be. Just a few verses before the text that we're going to look at in Daniel chapter 3, just a few verses before that in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had been having dreams, and he didn't know what they meant, and they were really bothering him. And he couldn't find anybody that could give him the interpretation and tell him what it meant. And then finally, here came one of the Jewish boys that they had brought out of captivity from Jerusalem, a man named Daniel, and Daniel was brought in and gave interpretation to the dream and told Nebuchadnezzar what it meant. And Nebuchadnezzar kind of liked it. He liked what Daniel told him. And he liked the fact that he was able to have it interpreted. So he elevated Daniel to a high place in his kingdom. And Daniel said, okay, I'll do that, but I'm going to bring my three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Say it with me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See, isn't that fun to say? <laughs> He brought these boys with him. And they were elevated also to positions and places of power and authority and prestige in the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar and in his sight. And he said, Nebuchadnezzar says uh, in verse 46 of, verse, of chapter 2, and I'm just going to read this, you know, then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation of a sweet odor unto Daniel. And then he said, Of truth, your God is the God of all gods. And He is the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets. And then it says, of course, that He elevated Daniel. Now, now we know that Nebuchadnezzar did not really get it. He did not really understand what he was saying. He didn't really understand or have a knowledge of a relationship with the one true God. Otherwise, he would have been worshiping God and not Daniel. And he wouldn't have just been calling him a, God, a good God among all gods. And we also know that he didn't understand what he was talking about and what he was doing because in the very beginning of the very next chapter, chapter 3, we find that Nebuchadnezzar constructs or has constructed this humongous monument to him, to Nebuchadnezzar. So now I want, a couple of things I want to say before we get into the text of the message and that is that when you're dealing with people in this life and in this world and in this flesh, and if they are people who are not grounded and founded in the Word of God, do not take their praise and adoration very serious because it will turn to hate in a moment, in a heartbeat. 
in order to have the kind of fellowship and joy and camaraderie that we have like we had around Miss Lois Ann right here a while ago, you have to be in the family of God. Amen. You have to be a part of the kingdom of God. And that only comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. But Nebuchadnezzar re resurrected or had built up this big monument to him and he gave specific instructions. And he said, when you hear all these musical instruments play, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you're going to bow down and you're going to give homage and you're going to give obedience to me. And you're going to pledge your honor to me and your loyalty to me. Well, of course, now we're ready to get into the message because we know that when that happened, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who had just been elevated to a great position because of their friend Daniel, these four people, they didn't do that. They didn't bow down. They didn't, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they got told on. And that's another thing that I want to want us to see, it says in verse 8 of chapter 3 that at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Isn't it amazing how there's always Chaldeans around? <laughs> there are always Chaldeans. Oh, if you don't know what they did, if you don't know what she said or where he went, unkind, mean, critical, judgmental, but let me tell you something, folks. When you live and run with people in the world, that's exactly what you're going to get. That's the only way they know to think. That's the only way they know to act. Because they don't have the love of God in Christ in their heart like you do if you're a born-again Christian. And if you're a born-again Christian and you have a love of God in your heart, be sure you're not ever guilty of being a Chaldean. Don't be a talebearer. Don't be a gossip. Don't spread rumors. Don't spread lies. If there's an issue, if there's a problem... You do it the old-fashioned cowboy way. It's also the old-fashioned Christian way. You go straight to that brother and look him right in the eye. You say, hey, I heard you did this. I heard you did that. heard you said this. heard you said that. Is it true? And you get it, as they say, from the horse's mouth. Anything you hear secondhand, you forget it. Don't be a Chaldean. But the Chaldeans ran to Nebuchadnezzar and said, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, these Jews, they heard the mention. They didn't bow down, Nebuchadnezzar. What are you going to do about these old boys, Nebuchadnezzar? They didn't honor your decree, Nebuchadnezzar. What are you going to do? And that's where we pick up our text in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 13. <coughs> verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury. Now isn't that amazing? He just got through promoting these boys. He just got through saying what wonderful Jews they were. He's glad to have them in his country. I'm even going to give you a place to work. Because Daniel, your good friend, interpreted my dream. Now, all of a sudden, in one act, almost in one day, it wasn't a little longer than that, but all of a sudden now he's filled with rage and fury. And he commanded that they bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not you serve my gods? plural, nor worship the golden image which I have set up, meaning me. Now if you be ready that at that time that you will hear, he goes through all the list of the musical instruments, that at that time you will fall down and worship the image which I have made, it will be well. But if you do not fall down and worship, you shall be cast that same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Well, just stick around, Nebuchadnezzar. You're going to find out who that God is. Amen. And so that's exactly what happened whenever he set the, all the musical instruments to going again and set everything off. Shadrach and Abishak and Abednego did not bow down. And so it was true in that day and it's true today, folks, the first step that we need to see in dealing with life dilemmas is to recognize the problem. And the problem is this. And I've listed it in a sentence with seven D's. You know me, I like letters. Words begin with the same letter. The devil designs. If you're taking notes, it's be a good place to wrap that down. I'll go back to that bulletin. The devil designs difficulties to distract, to derail, to defeat, and to destroy. And he is doing the same thing today he's been doing for thousands and thousands of years. And if you claim the name of Christ, 
And if New Heart Cowboy Church names the name of Christ, and if you and I lift up the name of Jesus, Satan is not happy. He's just using the representative of Nebuchadnezzar. Let's just use the words that describe Nebuchadnezzar because he was just a representative of Satan. He's full of rage and fury. That is Satan. And he's going to set his sights on you individually. He's going to set his sights on me. He's going to set his sights on this church and our fellowship. Now, it's our job to walk with God and to walk with Christ in fellowship where we can recognize what Satan's doing and when he's doing it and not be a Chaldean and run off somewhere just burying tails and talking about rumors. Don't do that. Get straight to God and get straight to one another and keep the fellowship what it ought to be. And we can understand, we're going to see how that happens in just a moment. But the problem is, that's point number one, the problem is that Satan and all of his unholy fallen demons are out to destroy you. And you need to understand that, you need to realize that, you need to accept that. As a child of God, Satan wants to destroy you. The fact is, whether you're a child of God or not, he wants to destroy you anyway. But if you're not a child of God, you're already destroyed as far as eternity is concerned. You have no hope. You have no eternal life or future apart from hell itself. And that's all you have. So he already has you destroyed. But if you're in Christ and I'm in Christ, the problem is that Satan, the Nebuchadnezzars of the world, want to come and they want to destroy us. That's what the whole story of the first 15 verses of chapter 3 are all about. And it didn't just stop here. You say, well, you know, that's Old Testament. That doesn't really apply. If you go over, and we're not going to turn there now, but if you go over later and look at Luke chapter 22, and in verse 31, you will see that Jesus speaking says, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you and sift you like wheat. In other words, Satan desires to destroy you. Now, I also think it's interesting, I'm not going to go to seed on this, it's a whole other message, but I think it's real interesting that he called him Simon. He didn't just call him Simon once, he called him Simon twice. Now, two verses later, he's going to call him Peter. But when he called him Simon, that's a generic Hebraic name that he called him. And also, when he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you, when you look that word you up in the Greek, it's plural. It wasn't just for Peter. That's the reason he called him Simon. What he was saying was, Satan wants the whole group. He wants the whole body of disciples, Simon. He wants all of you who are following me. And the same thing is true today. It's a plural pronoun. Satan desires to sift you like wheat. That means to destroy you. Yeah. That's his whole purpose. That's his whole game plan. And it's just as true today as it was then with Simon. And then in, cha in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, it says that the wiles of the devil, and the wiles of the devil are described as the lies, the trickery, the designs, all of the evil works that Satan does, the wiles of the devil. In verse 12 of chapter 6, it says, We wrestle not against rulers, although we do wrestle against rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness. Why do we wrestle with them? Because they're out to destroy us. They're out to destroy the fellowship that we have with Christ and the love that Christ has placed in our hearts. And then it says also in, in chapter back in Ephesians 6 and verse 16, it says that when we take on the whole armor of God, the reason we take the whole armor of God from head to toe is that we might quench all the fiery darts of Satan. And so we see and we understand and we find out that we are under the attack of fiery darts, we're under the attack of the wild, we're under the attack of the wickedness of all that Satan has to send against us, just like he did against Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. He was out to destroy them. And it says in verse 19, back in our passage in, in uh, Daniel chapter 3, beginning in verse 19, it says, Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of the vicious was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The very countenance on his face, he was so full of anger that he completely changed his appearance. Have you ever had somebody so mad at you that you just didn't hardly recognize him? He says that he commanded that they should, number one, heat the furnace seven times hotter than it usually was. Number two, he commanded the most mighty and burly men of the army to go and to take Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And number three, to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. 
And if you'll read the rest of that, we're not going to read all of it, but it says that the fire was so hot, being seven times hotter than normal, that even the soldiers, the biggest, the baddest, the burliest that he could come up with, when they got close enough to the furnace to throw these guys in, they were burned up and consumed outside the furnace themselves. Now that's a pretty hot furnace. Pressure's on. You ever felt that kind of pressure? You ever been in that kind of a fiery furnace? I trust not, but chances are you have been. If not, perhaps you will be. But just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you are in God, if you are in Christ, there is nothing, nothing, nothing to fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but He's given us the spirit of power and love and a sound mind. And you know the story of how it goes that, that whenever uh, they cast them into the burning fiery furnace and and 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, I'd like for us to look at that verse just real quickly before we pass to the next point. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, right after Peter says, cast all your cares upon Him because He cares for you, that's verse 7. But then he says immediately in verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, and if you have a different translation, it probably calls him your enemy. Your enemy, your adversary, the one who is against you, the devil, like a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And I cannot read that verse of Scripture without saying what I always say when we read it. Don't place all of your emphasis on Satan, even though he's an important part of that verse. Don't place all the emphasis on the fact that he's your enemy, even though that's an important part of the verse. Place your emphasis on the word a little. Remember how I said last week? Our, our salvation is made up in little three letters, two letter prepositions. Look at that little word, may. What's the difference between may and can? What's the difference? May is a word of permission. Father, may I go to school? <laughs> yes, you may. <laughs> Father, can I go to school? That's a word of ability. I don't know. Can you? Satan cannot, cannot destroy you unless you give him permission. He's seeking whom he may devour. And you give him permission by being a Chaldean. You give him a permission by lack of faith, by keeping lack of keeping your eyes and focus on Jesus. Just like was read while ago in Hebrews 12 too. Live looking at Jesus, whom he may devour. But the problem is, Satan wants to destroy you. The world wants to destroy you. And some of your own family, some of your own families would like to destroy you if you irritate them enough about being a Christian. And you know that as well as I do. Oh, then they'll destroy you to the point of death. They might destroy you to the point of putting you in a burning fiery furnace. But they want to destroy you to the point you'll just shut up and leave them alone. And unless they're under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, maybe that's what y'all do for a while. Just let the Holy Spirit work on them. I don't know. Pray about that. See what God tells you. But the main thing is for you and for me that we know and understand and realize and recognize what the problem is and that is that Satan's out to defeat us and to destroy us. And when we go into it heads up, then we're a step up on the game. And then the important thing that we need to see is when we go back to Daniel chapter 3, when, it, when, they, when they told Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and this, in this we see the plan, God's plan. First of all, we see the problem. Now we see God's plan. And His plan is not opposed to Satan destroying you. God's plan is to develop you and me. That is to mature you and me. Look at verse 16 in Daniel 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. We don't even have to think about it. We don't have to pause for a minute. If it be, if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and He will deliver us out of your hand, O King. There's, we're going to see two of the most important statements in this entire story, and I think, quite frankly, in all of our Christian experience, our God is Able. Amen. Nail it down. Put it in your spiritual backpack or wherever you carry your spiritual knowledge and remember it. Your God, my God, our God is able. And He shall deliver us. 
Well, now let's back up just a minute and look at Peter. Did Peter get sifted? Did Jesus say, I'm going to pray for you that you might be delivered? Which he did. But did he get delivered? Or did he deny? What about Jesus? In the garden. He said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Let me not have to be destroyed. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, after beseeching the Lord numerous times to deliver him of his ailment, his problem, finally he said, Lord, I realize that your grace is sufficient, and I realize that in my weakness your strength is made perfect. And in that situation, God had the honor and glory to the point that you and I are still quoting that scripture and still talking about it today. So when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, our God's able to deliver, if God had delivered them, if God had not let them go into that burning fire furnace, do you think we'd be talking about them today like we are? And that leads us to the second most important statement in all the Scripture, and David, this is for you. But if not. But if not. First three words of verse 18. But if not. Be it known unto you, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, that we will not serve you, we will not serve your gods, we will not worship your golden image which you have set up. And folks, when you and I get to that place in God's plan of maturity and development, when you can look life in the face and say, I am going to serve God and my God's going to deliver me, but if not, I will still serve God and still love God and still be truthful to God. Amen. That's the sign of a Christian that's maturing and growing up and developing in God's plan. Anybody can go along as long as life is easy, right? Anybody can go along as long as the blessings are flowing. But when the buffetings and the trials and the tribulations start to come and mark it down, they will come. When that happens... God's looking for a people who will still rejoice in Jesus and still glorify His name and still trust in Him and still claim Him as their Lord and Savior and who will still look to Him and know that God's plan is perfect and that God's plan, even in the fiery furnace, is exactly where a child of God wants to be if that's where God is. And in fact, what happens what happens? And it says that after all of this happened, all that took place, in verse 24, Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and he rose up in haste and spoke and said unto his counselors and advisors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto him, That's right, king. That's the truth. He answered and said, But lo, I see four men loosed and walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the fire, and the form of the first is like the Son of God. Now I ask you a question. Would you rather be outside the fiery furnace and be digging with life yourself, or would you rather be in the fiery furnace and have Jesus walking right there with you? I pray you'd rather be in the burning fiery furnace, especially when you're going to have the testimony and the witness that these boys had when they came out because not a hair on them was singed. Their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. <laughs> God is the God of deliverance. You, know, you realize that's what the word salvation means? Deliverance or deliverer. And just as God delivered these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, from the burning fiery furnace because that was His plan, He can and will and shall do the same thing in your life and in mine. God always, always, always has a plan and a purpose. Just keep your eyes on Him. Just keep your eyes on Him. Our problem is we get our eyes off of Him and we want to form our own plans. We want to form our own ideas and then we want to ask God to put a stamp of approval on it. And God doesn't work that way. He just calls for us and asks for us to be obedient and to trust in Him in all things. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. Just write it down. You can look it up later. 1 Peter chapter 4, and verses 12 through 14. Beloved, 
Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. Isn't that interesting that we use that term all the way over here several thousand years later in the New Testament? Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to test you as though some strange thing has happened to you, but rejoice in so much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when His glory, mark it, His glory, shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now what that's saying is that when we come to a place in a time of fiery trials and testing and tribulation, God's glory is going to be exemplified and lifted up. And if you're a child of God, that's the desire of your heart, that God be glorified in your life and lifted up in your life. And it's going to bring exceeding joy. But I want you to really notice what he says right here verse 14. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. For the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. The Spirit of God and of glory rest on you. When does that happen? During fiery trials. During times of things sometimes not going so well. Of course it's true all the time we allow it to be, but it is during these times especially that we come to understand and appreciate the fact that God's glory and God's Spirit rest on us. And if you'll notice that word rest of is a present active verb. It continues and continues and goes on and on and on. And what it means when He rests upon us, it means to repose and remain, and it also means that He might restore and refresh. So if you today need restoring and refreshing, and if you today would like to know that the Spirit of God, the very presence of God, is reposing and resting upon you, then just put yourself in His hands and ask and submit and surrender for whatever He can do in your life that will bring Him honor and glory, even if that involves a fiery fire, fiery furnace. And you say, well, that's just not normal, Pastor Vic. That's just, like you. we don't want to pray for her. No, I didn't say pray for her. I'm just saying that you would pray that whatever God wants to do in your life, it will bring Him honor and glory. And if it happens to be some kind of a trial or a tribulation, if it happens to be, trust me, you're going to learn with Paul, His grace is sufficient. You're going to learn with Paul that in your weakness, God's strength is made perfect. You're going to learn with Peter that once you are changed, you see, Peter was considered the leader of the bunch. He was the forerunner of the disciples. He was, by all accounts, probably the biggest and the burliest and the strongest, and he was the most verbal. There was no doubt about it. But yet he was full of himself, and he was full of pride, and he was full of self-dependence and arrogance. But after he denied Christ three times in one night, the next day Peter was a converted, changed different disciple. And what did Jesus tell him to do once that happens? He said, Peter, once you're changed, strengthen the brethren. So if you want to be used, if you're willing to be used as an instrument in God's hand to strengthen your brothers and sisters in Christ, be willing to go through the fiery furnace that God can purify and cleanse away whatever it is in your life that stands between you and Him that you can be used to strengthen the brethren. You can be used to be a testimony to the others who do not know Christ, perhaps even. But God's plan and purpose is always to develop you and to build you up and to mature you. Quite the opposite of Satan's plan to destroy you and to tear you down. And then the third thing that we see back in Daniel, back in our uh, text over in the book of Daniel, we see that we find God's presence. God's presence. It says, as we've already read, that when they looked in the burning fiery furnace, they saw the form of a fourth that was there with them, lingering with them, and walking with them. And they who had been bound up and tied when they went into the fiery furnace were loosed and were freely walking around. I want to read you very quickly about three verses of Scripture, all from the book of Isaiah, that talk about the reality and the beauty and the fact of God's presence with us. The first one's in Isaiah chapter 40. Verses 28 and 29. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, 
Isn't that beautiful? The everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is He weary, and there is no searching of His understanding. He gives power to the faint and to those who have no might. He increases strength. As long as you have might and strength in yourself, God's strength is of none effect. The Bible says that God's people were greatly helped until they were strong and then they became defeated. As long as we realize as Paul did that in our weakness, His strength is made perfect and we cast ourselves upon Him and recognize our need totally for Him. And that does away with pride and arrogance. And it replaces it with contrition and with humility, which is what God desires. Still in Isaiah in verse 41, this time in verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will uphold you with my right hand of righteousness. Don't be dismayed. That's somewhere in there with defeated or destroyed or cast down or full of pity. All of which are not faith. So don't be dismayed and don't let life and the struggles and the fiery furnaces overcome you, but overcome them through the power of God as God overcomes all things through you as your strength. One more in Isaiah this time. Isaiah 43 in the first two verses. But now, thus saith the Lord who created you and who formed you, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. Isn't that beautiful? God's called you by your name. Remember that verse we looked at not too long ago? He's written your name in the palm of His hand. You're just that close. If you're a grandparent, you probably have a picture of a grandchild hanging in a magnet on a refrigerator maybe. That'd be, a, that'd be a pretty good message someday. God's magnet. You're that close to God. And every time He looks at His hand, He sees your name. I have redeemed you. I 